Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome to Password Con Room. Let's get excited for our next speaker, Dwayne McDaniel, who's going to be talking about do you know where your secrets are? Exploring the problem of secret sprawl and secret management maturity. Let's go. Sponsors, we want to thank you, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe. Shout out to our gold sponsor, Blue Cat, Plex Track, and Toyota. It's their support, our other donors, and you all, which make this possible. Please turn off your cell phones. Nobody wants to hear your Bone Thugs and Harmony ringtone, okay? If you have any questions, save it to the end. With that, further ado, Dwayne, what's up? Hey. Thanks very much for that intro. Um, if you don't want to turn off your cell phones, uh, just turn off the ringtone. But yeah, please take pictures if you want uh, and post them on the internet, please. Um, thanks for all coming this afternoon. Uh, hope everybody, is everybody having a good B-side so far? Awesome. That's so-so, apparently. Um, so I'll before I give my intro, I have a prize hat up here. I'm asking specific questions. Who saw the last session in here? All right, you guys are going to get a chance to win some prizes from me based on what you heard before because uh, I work with Mac. Um, so I live in Chicago. I've been a developer advocate since 2016. There are about, uh, depending on how you count developer advocacy in the early days, but mostly come from the DevOps space, uh, the platform play space security. This is my first B-Sides Las Vegas. So thank you all for having me. I'm very <laughs> nervous to be here. Uh, this is the biggest imposter syndrome I've had this year. This is like my fourth B-sides, so you guys are all special. Um, if you want to hit me up on X or Twitter, or whatever they're calling it these days, it's MC Dwayne, and it will be until they take the service down. Uh, I'm also on Insta and all the other places, MC Dwayne, uh, including GitHub. I should probably put that on here because that's a more reliable platform than all of them, and hopefully it's more reliable. And hit me up about anything if I'm talking about it today or if you want to talk about karaoke, which who's going to karaoke tonight? Okay, it'll be me singing by myself. Um, but if you want to come hear me sing by myself, or you want to talk about rock and roll, uh, you want to see a rock and roll show, please hit me up. I'm always happy to talk about rock and roll. Um, very quickly, I work for Git Guardian. They're going to come up a lot in this talk because a lot of the research was done by them. In fact, all of the research, because that's where I work. That's just how it works. Um, so we have a booth over there. And we can talk to you about hard-coded secrets and checking how they leak and all that. Um, but that'll just leave that for the hallway over there. So in summary, just don't leak your credentials and you're good. And you can go home and sleep well at night. You've done it, success. Unfortunately, I have to keep giving this talk and other talks like it. Uh, so two thirds of this talk is just gonna be a bunch of facts and figures that might be terrifying, especially if you weren't aware of them before. And some people will just nod along and say, hey, I've heard this before. I've heard things like this before, specifically <laughs> the guy that talked right before me, Mackenzie, my colleague, who's also a developer advocate at Git Guardian. Uh, we didn't plan that. That's how the schedule worked out. Um, but if you do feel panicked or fear like you're talking about my company, uh, just recite the litany against fear and everything will be OK. After all, we're talking about the Internet. Nobody really dies on the Internet, do they? Uh, that's maybe a, not a great joke. But uh, Uber, they're still out there. They still exist. But this happened to them. Uh, anybody remember this from 2002 or 22? Um, so Super Admin gets fished. And they're doing it right. They got 2MFA on or 2-factor authentication on. And the theory is he got flooded with so many requests that his thumb slipped. We'll never know. Maybe he just got mad at Uber and said, okay, I'm just going to let this one through. Anyway, the request went through uh, the spammer are the attacker uh, who was from the Lapsus group, uh, which is a UK-based hacking group, um, got in, was able to take that Superman's credentials, go through the VPN, long story short, found PowerShell scripts chock full of hard-coded credentials for everything. And he got into everything, including their HackerOne account, and told HackerOne, hey, I hacked into Uber, I'm cool. And they're like, yeah, this is the, that's probably not true. So he floods their, uh, their Slack with memes and takes over all the channels. And they're like, yeah, this is some prankster. And the next person you talk to is the New York Times. And that's why we know about the story. What did he actually steal? We'll never know. 
did we see a wall of new security job postings from Uber the next day after that, sir? Yes, we, we, we did. Um, Circle CI, who got affected by this? Who had stuff in production for this? Is anybody here a developer? Does anybody use Circle CI? Wow, that's a, that's a first. That is literally a first for me given this talk that, or this bringing this up that no one even, nobody got a hit. Um, Basically, the kerning messed up, and I'm really mad about that because that was fine 10 minutes ago. Anyhow, um, sh long story short, attacker hits a remote developer. Remote developer's environment gets compromised. Attacker gets into the Circle CI internal frameworks uh, and internal platforms, plants malware that starts stealing credentials. That then takes those credentials and gets into customer accounts. The same day that they come out and say, hey, we had to rotate all of the access keys, sorry if it took down your production instance, but we had to rotate them. Uh, same day, a, a independent researcher said, hey, something's going on with Circle CI because all my honey tokens went off. And now we know why. Someone actually got a hold of their credentials and was attempting to exploit them. I don't have fancy graphics for everything else. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, not in a good way, but just I think it's interesting. Uh, anybody drive a Toyota? Do you have the T-Connect no app? Way. Yeah, that's the right answer. Uh, at Toyota, back uh, in 2017, subcontracted someone to do maintenance on it. Good idea, in general. For some reason, that subcontractor pushed a portion of the T-Connect code onto a public GitHub repo. Why? We'll never know. It takes a security researcher until 2022 to figure out that that contains an actual data key that affected 296,000 customers. Uh, nothing super sensitive, so email accounts and um, some identifying information, but no pet, like credit cards. Uh, so Toyota Japan uh, puts out a really nice blog post and statement saying, hey, you're probably gonna get fished, be on the lookout, it might not be us, just be aware. But for five years, it took them five years to figure that out. Uh, AstraZeneca. All we know are the very scant details that got released, but it was the perfect storm, tempest in a teacup kind of situation where a developer pushes the test environment credentials into GitHub public. No big deal, it's a test credential. Like what, what on earth can happen in a test environment? Well, somebody else inside AstraZeneca pushed actual customer data into the test environment. We don't know how big this was. We just know what happened. Because it's HIPAA, they can't just come out and say, this many customers, um, and they didn't. Unlike airline crashes uh, that come out immediately and say, hey, we had a crash, we are gonna fix it, and here's exactly what went wrong, and here's exactly the steps. In security, we all just kind of get, oh, we'll make best effort, sorry, and move on. This one's kind of scary to me, because I am an AstraZeneca customer. We live in this world of, of constant cat and mouse. Uh, literally, people trying to get in and get our data and our hardware resources, our machine resources. Alfred, uh, the creator of CyberCop, the first commercial honeypot that ever got released, um, said this, and I think it's a great, a great, very nice summary of why we should take this stuff seriously. I think it would be reduced to this. Attackers, and this, this is supported by like Verizon DBIR report, if you haven't read the DBIR this year, go read it. It's a great chock full of things. Ransomware is kind of ebbing and flowing, and uh, it turns out that uh, Log4j, we got mitigated, and it's kind of not, it's still a problem, but anyway, DBIR is full of, of good info. But 80 plus percent of all attacks are organized crime at this point, of malware attacks. Um, yeah, there are nation state actors, like we all know about Microsoft and their forged key that happened last month. Um, so that was a, the China backed hacking group attacked them and guy was trying to get into the State Department and Commerce Department. That stuff happens. There are hacktivists that just want to make companies look bad, like the kid from Lapsus. He was 19, so I say kid, um, young man from Lapsus, uh, who d did it for the lulls, apparently, and just to make Uber look bad publicly. But most people are after the top two. Anybody know, want to guess? This isn't for the prize hat, by the way. Uh, but anybody want to guess what? Number one, why they want your machine resources? Why do they want your data? Money, but and how do they get your money? 
ransomware. My favorite joke I heard all of last year was, how did the hacker evade the FBI? They ransomware. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's the exact right response. Thank you all. Um, the one thing all of those attacks have in common that I went through, and again, I'm not trying to scare you all, but this is reality, is that there was a credential somewhere along the path that gave the attacker access to other things or a credential that was misplaced because it was hard-coded when it shouldn't have been hard-coded. Attackers, going back, oh, oh if you're here for a second, what we see them commonly do to get these things is lateral slides, lateral movement through the environment, trying any door they can get their hands on, and then escalate privileges up. Let's take over the machines, escalate the privileges as high as we can, and then go see what else we can get into and escalate those privileges. Lateral slide, escalate up, time and time and time and time again. But because of that, we kind of know how to defend for that, or we should, and that's what we get to in the later part of this. But when it's just a quick definition, we, I use the word secret and credential interchangeably because they mean the same thing to me in my head, but this is what I mean by it. It is... An API key, a username, anything that gives you access to another system or decrypts data. That's it. Like if, if it's an EMV file, a CRT, or what have you, um, an actual SSH key, something that should be secret. You should not be sharing that out in the world. This is how it commonly ends out in the world. And I do this all the time. Anybody want to guess why we do this? It's easy. It's easy. And when do you need to do something easy because you're in the middle of a, a rush? T testing and debugging. Like, I just need to make sure this credential works. Is this the right password? And if you do it locally and you take it right back out of your local file, who cares? That, that's how we debug things. That's what we do in life. The problem is then we add, commit, and push. And that's where the problem really escalates. To the point of... We put out this report every year. Feel free to download it if you want. That's the first big third of this, this talk, is just going through these. Um, so we, as a platform, since 2017, have looked at every single public Git commit. You can as well, if you want, api.github.com slash timeline, uh, or maybe events. I always get the two confused. But th there's a public API you can just go subscribe to. It's in JSON. It's over 6 billion, 60 billion commits deep. It's, it's insane. Um, last year alone, there were over a billion commits that we scanned. Again, just public GitHub. So not public Replit or GitLab public or anything like that. Um, and we're seeing a giant growth in GitHub year over year, a 27% increase in developers just in 2022. Um, at the time, the fastest growing language we were seeing was HTL. Uh, anybody know what that goes to? Terraform, yeah, that's great. You guys are awake. I'm loving that this is just far enough after lunch that you're still awake and the coffee's kicked in from the 3 o'clock coffee rush. All right, first question from the prize hat. And probably heard this stat if you were in the last talk. Who, uh, who knows how many secrets were discovered last year in public GitHub by GitGuardian? Who said that? Uh, you get a piece of candy. There you go. All right. Yeah, 10 million. Uh, that's a terrifying number and that's a fun way to deliver it. Uh, yeah, we found 10 million hard-coded credentials. This was a 67% increase over the previous year and I have a slide that lays that out, but this isn't cumulative. This isn't over all of time. This is just new ones out of that, how many billion? 1.27 billion commits. How we did it? That's public as well. We built our own detector engines, but we documented it all out there, and that's where you can go look at the actual how we did it. So they're just saying it's all supported out there. All right. Second question. On average, how many commits per thousand commits contain a, a secret? Uh, so I need hands now because I can't just hear them. All the way in the back. What? 100? A little high. Anybody else? Yeah. Ten? A little bit, a little bit high still. Anybody else? Six, 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 six point nine. Fifty-six point nine. That's a great specific, but no. 
Anybody? Anybody else? I will give it Price is Right rules. Over there. I'm not going to throw it, but 5.5, you get an apple. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can come up and get it later, or if you, you want to pass this back here. Here, I'll throw it to you, and you, you, you can pass that back to him. You get an apple. 5.5 uh, out of every thousand commits on GitHub public last year contained a credential, a hard-coded credential. That means one out of every 10 authors pushed one. You can see the previous years, like there was a little over 6 million we discovered in 2021, uh, over almost 3 million we discovered in 2020. And again, this isn't a cumulative number. This is brand new ads. And when we stop and think about like the fact that GitHub itself only grew 27%, this is startling. So who's doing this stuff? It turns out it's everybody. It's not, can't just be new people. That's the answer. Um, so this is where they're coming from, and I don't want to point fingers, but it kind of makes sense when you think about general populations. But does anyone see a weird or missing nation off of this list? Anybody, any security researchers in here that investigate um, where origins of attacks come from? Yeah, Russia's all the way at the bottom. It's on this list, but there's one missing. Oh, yeah, th they should definitely be on there as well. But I think that's tied to the other answer. Uh, so North Korea isn't doing public GitHub. That's the other reason they're not on here. Um, Indonesia. So go look at where attacks are coming from, and you're going to surprise by your logs. You start tracing IP addresses. At least in my research, I found, like, a shocking number of, like, Indonesia. And, like, why are they coming from Indonesia? And I've talked to other people about this, and there's no clear answer Maybe they're trampolining. Maybe North Korea is using Indonesia as an attack vector. All we know is that Indonesia isn't leaking their secrets onto public GitHub. That's what this data tells us. Anyway, moving on. Um, so if we look at specific categories of, oh, wait a minute, that was supposed to be one of my question slides, wasn't it? Oh, no. Oh, I moved it around. Sorry. That was supposed to be a question slide. Um, so if we look at the how, which specific secrets got shared out there, what types. Um, other is the biggest category because other is literally the bucket for all of the other like 2%, 5%, 7% that weren't big enough to show up at the 3.8. So let's, let's ignore the other for a second and I should have just taken that out. But data storage is number one, cloud providers number two, which totally tracks to what we originally talked about. Attackers are only after two things and they're disgusting because uh, they want your money. Messaging systems, why do you think messaging systems uh, are important? What? Off. Off? Others? Yeah. Um, I, I think what I heard between those and what the answer I'm looking for was, was plotted out um, is there's a lot of companies that think, okay, I'm just going to pass this key between developers through the system. It's better than email, right? Slack, you know, it's, it's slightly better in email. Um, anyway, we still look at generic detectors as well. So we have specific detectors look at like specific providers and then general generic detectors that look for things that look like high entropy passwords, things that are base 64 encoded, um, bearer tokens, things like that. Generic passwords is the vast majority of that. And now I'm just getting into stats and figures on it, but all right, we'll go back to the specifics. Who thinks they know the most commonly leaked specific secret in 2022? Uh, AWS. I, I would have thought so too, but it wasn't. Anybody else? What? Oh, sorry. He said AWS. Any other guesses? Nope. No other. Any other big providers out there? Anybody want to guess? Google. Who said Google? You get, you get a marker that if you spill something on yourself, it'll white it out um, on a Tide pen. Um, uh, yeah, Google API keys. 9.7% of all the 10 billion or 10 million we detected were Google API keys. Uh, you can see the rest of it splits out. Again, other skews everything and it's weird and the colors choices were not mine uh, when we built this. But you can see like that's how it spreads out. 
All right, this is, I can talk about stats and figures all day, but the what I want to get to is later here. Uh, what's the fastest growing leak secret we've seen in 2023? Technically open API, but I'll give it to you. Uh, you get progress software Kleenexes. Um, I didn't just clean out my bag to do this, I swear. I had candy in it and didn't eat all the candy. Um, but yeah, uh, this so far this year we found over 50,000 incidents with open AI keys. It's not the largest number, but it's the fastest growing considering last year there were basically none. Um, it was not even detectable last year. I went and dug in the stats and I forget it, but it's a very small number that's in the other category. All right, but what does this mean for your enterprise? So these are all interesting stats, sure, and for you as developers to think about, but what does this mean for the companies you work for? Well, we went out and asked. We asked 507 people that said they're decision makers in IT, and we put together a report what they said in the voice of the practitioners, state oh, secret and AppSec. That's a really long title. Um, all right, only got two more of these, I promise. Um, what percentage of IT leaders said they experienced a secret leak in the last 18 months? 95%. A little bit lower. It's price right rules, by the way. 100? <laughs> I, I think that's more accurate. No, but what did you... Oh, any other guesses? 26? Higher. 36. That's a good guess, too. 75. 75 on the nose. You get, you get some notepads that say Adobe on them. 75% um, of respondents said in the last 18 months they had experienced a secret leak. 60% of those, or 60% of all people said it somehow impacted their company and employees. That's the reality, and that's why we need to get on top of this and solve it, because we're starting to really impact the bottom line for our companies. 94% um, said they're planning to improve their secret practices in the next 12 to 18 months. This is my ultimate problem with survey-based research, is people can say a lot of interesting things. And this is proof. We, this is select all that apply. Uh, anybody see a problem with the math on this, like immediately? Yeah, because all these IT leaders are like, yeah, I'm probably going to fix it. Um, yeah, there's, Budget. we're probably dealing with this. Yeah, but we're all we're all dealing with budgets. Only so much time in the day. But everybody's got this plan that one day we're going to fix it. One day we're going to do something about it. We know it's a problem, and that's what I keep harping on. Um, for the people that did experience, and I know I went through that real fast. I'll leave this up here for a second longer. Um, for the people that did experience that. 27% admitted that they were relying only on manual code reviews. Who thinks that's a good idea? Yeah, I've never had anyone raise their hand on that. I love manual code reviews. I think there's a serious value to the manual code review. How else do you teach junior devs anti-patterns? How else do you teach them this is not lining up with the business value of our company? That's what code reviews are great at. The human-to-human -human connection, pair programming, that's, that's get overall better together. Finding an individual string that's wrong, man, humans are terrible at that. That's what machines are great at. Um, so for people that did report they had a leak, how many, this is their self-reported number, average number of occurrences, and by occurrence, I mean, if it's the secret is shared within a repo, how many places in the repo did it appear? Three. And any other guesses? Price is right rules, it is 3.95, last piece of candy, right? Uh, who's, I thought I said eight. You said three. All right, that's the last piece of candy, and that is the end of the prize hat for now. Uh, I got one more thing, but I don't have any more questions. All right, um, so uh, done with the prize hat. Now we're done with the silly part. Um, I, I did that to kind of, because this is all terrifying news, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> none of this should have been sleep well at night. Um, so what do we do about it? And that's where I want to end with the last 10, 15 minutes. Who here is familiar with Dora metrics? Dora metrics, the uh, Accelerate. Anybody here read Accelerate? Okay, there's a book called Accelerate, uh, and the th research they did in there uh, formed the DevOps research, uh, I don't remember what the A stands for, not association, but um, it, basically this is how you measure the success of a DevOps organization. Actually, let's just, real quick, 
Dora metrics. Tricks. Metrics. Yeah, how to measure software delivery. So you can go to, well, this is not the one I was looking for because Google has the official one. There we go, Google Cloud. Um, but we can take how all DevOps organizations perform and break it down into these four leading metrics. Uh, deployment frequency, uh, assessment, that's what it is. Research, DevOps research and assessment. I never remember what the A is for. Um, de deployment frequency, how often an organization successfully releases to production. Lead time for changes, how fast they get a change out the door. Change failure rate, the percentage of deployments that cause a failure and the time to restore service. If something breaks, how long does it take to fix it? You can take just these four metrics and judge the overall health of a DevOps organization. So says their research, which is also survey based, but half the book of Accelerate explains why that works. Um, Nicole Ferguson um, and other people wrote this, Gene, Kim, um, a lot of really smart people. So go read Accelerate. So we took that idea of like, well, how do we map out what a successful organization looks like? And we said, this is wrong. This isn't good enough. This is what Google's entire developer documentation says, if you leak a secret. Simply just go re-architect your app. Good luck. They didn't even say good luck. Um, I don't recall saying good luck. Uh, but this isn't good. This doesn't tell you what you need to know. So. We think that it starts with, hey, use a vault, cool. Uh, e either like something off the shelf like Azure Corp Vault or if you're using Azure, Azure Key Vault or AWS Secrets Manager or what have you, that's a good start. But that's a start. So how do we map out how we get to success? And I think it comes down to really three pillars. You gotta have people invested in the process that trained and they know that, hey, this is a problem we need to fix. We gotta stay on top of this. You gotta have clear processes that are documented that show this is what we should be doing and here is exactly how we do it. And then you rely on the tools. Because if you just throw developers Key Vault, you're not gonna have success. <laughs> Key Vault is good, but it's not something you do on an individual basis if you're working in a team. It's a team effort. Same thing with HashiCorp Vault. Yeah, you can use HashiCorp Vault completely on your own by yourself as a developer, but if you don't implement it as a team, you're not gonna find the results you want. And if you try to automate things completely on your own without having the processes in place, everything's gonna fall apart. It's the three-leg problem. Remove one of the pillars, everything falls apart. But anyway, we just think it boils down to five levels. And of course, computer science, we're off by one, so we start with zero. Uh, and this is never meant to be an accusation. So never feel like, hey, you have to be better. This is our general guide of like, here's how we think teams can improve over time and a general roadmap for you. So just a place to gauge where you are as an org. And then how do you have that conversation with your DevOps leads and your operations team and your CISOs and your CTO? Say, here's where we think we need to get to based on where we're at at the moment. So level zero is a lot of organizations. That's why we put it at the base of the pyramid. On the secret management side, they're hard coding credentials. And we already went through all the rigmarole in the first part of this talk of why that's bad. It's just everything's unencrypted. You're throwing things just willy nilly into your code base, throwing it through your CI environments. And there's a password in place somewhere that's hope for the best or the best answer you can have of what are you doing for security? Oh, we have a firewall. That's not good enough. Um, and then the secret detection side, how do you know if people are leaking credentials here and there? You don't, you just don't. You're taking their word for it. You're not even doing manual code reviews at this point. Again, not an accusation, just this is where we see like the very bottom level, if you're starting a project and you've never thought about this stuff, it's probably where you're at. And then you get people that are starting to think, hey, maybe, Maybe I need to use an EMV file because if I store my EMV file outside of the repo, that's what AWS tells me to do with the .aws slash credentials file. That totally works, and it does. 
Problem is, sometimes people move that into the repo and then they forget to set git ignore or they modify git ignore that it allows it to be shared or they copy paste the entire repo or the entire folder and the EMV folder into a bucket. Last year, there was a firm that found 1.5 million Git repos that contain secrets in public S3 buckets. People just threw them there because they could store them out there for cheap. Git ignore does not work outside of Git servers. Um, but okay, but, but we're moving in the right direction. Let's take um, our, our config files uh, and let's group them together. Let's make sure we're storing things externally from our repos. And you're starting to think like, okay, maybe we shouldn't hard code. That's a good first step. Um, oh yeah, and log data. We finally realized that our plain text credentials are in our log data. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should build sanitizers in there. Please. Um, but secrets aren't really scoped. Like everything is just fully allowed to do everything because that's fast and easy. And now you're starting to periodically look through and say like, okay, manually, did we, did we check for this? And secrets are in fact rotated manually sometimes when you remember it, when you think it's a good idea, the alarm goes off. Hey, time to rotate that AWS key from last year. Again, better than where you were before you're on the right path. That's the conversation you should be having. It's like, how can we do this better? If you include one of these 1% every day, you're going to get to the next level pretty quick. So intermediate people. Now we start using vaults. Now we start using secret managers. Now we're starting to scope things correctly. So if someone does get a hold of it, the only thing it can do is a very specific limited thing that you cannot escalate. It doesn't allow escalation. Uh, showing things dynamically, uh, or no, you're loading the secrets in dynamically from the vaults correctly everywhere. So if someone does get to your code, they see vault.projectName.secretName.secret that's programmatically calling it in. That's, that's awesome. Like if I was an attacker, I'd think, oh man, I don't got time for this. Got to figure out some other way in. You're starting to scan things at the developer level automatically. And you're starting to, uh, you scan continuously at the PR process, the merge process, the PR, the merge request process that every time the code's going to get merged into your main branch. Yeah. We've, we've, we're, we're scanning at that point. And starting to look at your build outputs to see if any scan secrets got jammed into there. So scan your Docker images, your PyPy packages. And that rotation is still manual, but uh, they're rotated, at least, at least periodically. And you kind of see where this is all going. And I'm starting to run out of time. And I do want to leave time for questions. But uh, level three is, okay, well now we're going to start doing this for real. Everybody is going to use Vault. All right, there is a clearly defined process around how to use it. And rotation is clearly defined. And it's a regular scheduled event. And we know when it's going to happen. Now we start actively monitoring logs because we know that, hey, this stuff's going to get leaked. Let's start actively looking for it on the regular with some tools that let us do that. Datadog, log IO, logs IO, they're all... There's not one winner here. There's a bunch of ways to do this. Uh, and now developers are starting to use tools to scan before they push. Uh, this is where Truffalog comes in, Git leaks. Uh, we have GG Shield. Um, there's, if you're just looking for pure detectors, there's a lot of solutions out there on the open source. Um, AWS Secrets, uh, or C AWS Labs Git Secrets is another good one if you're all in on AWS. Um, but you're starting to build that into your Git um, Git hooks system. So every time you go to make a commit, automatically check. The remediation process involves the developer. Now you're getting asked, like, why is this here? And you start getting into uh, holding the developer's account for why they're doing that. Maybe it's a test credential. Maybe there's nothing to worry about. Maybe you're, maybe they did it by accident. Maybe they didn't know. Maybe they weren't trained. Maybe they didn't get the notification. Maybe they didn't read the memo. We can start fixing the people and the processes and the tools all together. All right, and then we get to our expert level. No matter where you are here, this is where we think you can get to because we know companies that are at this level. We work with them day in, day out. 
there's a central vault storage or hardcore, um, not hardcore, hardware managed device storage that has complete clear access logs. You know exactly who's called what secrets when, who changed things, who was in the system at all. It's all clearly logged and actively monitored. Secrets are dynamic, meaning they change constantly. The best passwords are the ones that do not exist, and you've gone to a system that is relying on IAM rules uh, wherever possible, and the only passwords are the ones that are mandatory, but those are very short-lived. So if someone gets a hold of it, they probably already expired, the one they have the hold on. Um, you're, starting, you're checking throughout the entire pipeline at every step. Uh, that's what I'm saying, the OpenID Connect. You're starting to replace... Um, passwords with tokens, short-lived tokens. Um, yeah, and you're enforcing things. So that's the, the process and the people part. Like, hey, you didn't do this right. Thank you. Um, how, how do we fix that? How do we, as a team, make this better? Now you're scanning every single commit every single time it moves, even before it's made, consistently across the board. Everybody does it. If not, and it still shows up, there are consequences to that. Uh, not be a heavy handed, but it's, hey, why are you pushing secrets continually? We told you not to do that. Here's all the training. Here's exactly the tools. Now it's a you problem, a specific person problem. Um, and monitoring is ongoing, continual, and secrets automation, or secrets rotation is completely automatic. Has anyone ever flipped, has anyone here flipped on AWS automatic rotation? Or I guess AWS users in the room. How many of you use the secret rotation automation? It's there, it's in the documentation. It's one config, right on. Please be proud. Um, with all the other tools you can do it, there's systematic ways to go about this. So again, you can download this, but this is what we would love for everybody to go have that conversation with their teams. like. Hey, we think we're at a level one, but we're almost a level two. What? Why don't we talk about processes to get to that, to get to here? We want this to be a roadmap of where you can find success, not a judgment, not a, we should feel bad. Nobody should feel bad. It's a journey. Nobody's born knowing this stuff. Not even Linus. So in conclusion, it's a constant cat and mouse game and the stakes are very real. I was talking to a colleague who said their company leaked an AWS credential. They caught it within five minutes. They got a bill for $150,000. Because they caught it, they pulled it out of the code, but it still took a while for them to rotate it. That's the stakes we're playing with now. Uh, OpenAI... Uh, there's a dark reading article. I didn't quote it in here, but uh, actually I did quote it in here. Uh, but it's a uh, Replit. Um, Replit has does not have any automated checking for their code. Uh, if you leak uh, OpenAI secret onto GitHub public, there's a deal between GitHub and OpenAI that will invalidate that. They'll send an invalidation request immediately, and you're safe. You leak that same credential on Replit, it will live until someone tells takes it down like you, or then send your own invalidation request. Uh, yeah, somebody got um, a bill for $110,000 because a hacker group found it on Replit and passed it around in Discord. And everybody got a free AI that day. But that's the stakes we're playing against. So again, don't wanna make anybody feel bad about this stuff, and I don't really wanna scare anyone, but bring it to your attention, have the conversations internally, I'm Dwayne. I live in Chicago. I've been a developer advocate since about 2016. Hit me up on Twitter about anything. And if you want to sing some karaoke or talk about rock and roll, I'll be around. Oop, wrong direction. Thanks. <laughs> and with that, I'll open up any questions. And we do have a mic because we're on the internet. Right there. Hi, great talk. Um, Thanks. You mentioned you scan all of public GitHub and you yep. find these credentials. I imagine the vast majority of people putting secrets into public GitHub are small developers, small companies, people that aren't going to have tremendous amounts of professional experience. 
you you also scan private repos as well. Do the metrics line up? Uh, sorry, is there a difference in the like the ratio of the metrics from like professional developers and enterprise versus what you find on public GitHub? Is it comparable or is it? it this actually really interesting to bring that up because um, we just are talking about that internally. What I can share publicly because again we're dealing with private repos and customers and NDAs and all that. What I can share is uh, we have severity scoring on, and it's automatic on the system. So if it's valid and it's public, um, it automatically gets a critical score. Uh, we do see a, a curve. Um, I can't say exactly the numbers, but we do see a curve downward of um, the more professional the organization, the higher they are on that list. The li but I think that's uh, the the more that that curve so it's um less severe less criticality from those teams but that's a result of their maturity in our opinion that's what we think is actually happening is like yeah they're consistently using hash court vault so they're leaking a lot fewer secrets that hit that criticality curve um so it's a combination of those things so it's not like one thing i can point to it's like oh there's just juniors or that's a brand new company um but yeah i can't i don't actually can't release those numbers <laughs> Uh, on the individual, but that's a good question. But yeah, we do see people that are checking consistently are higher on the elevation scale and there's nothing controversial or secret about that. Right. Any other questions? I did have one other prize and since you asked the first question, it's a cord minder. Sorry, I almost hit you in the head. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. There you go, it's cord uh, minder. So you mentioned about a manual code review Where? and... Uh, Who's it? Oh, uh, right there. Yep, yep. Okay. So <laughs> you mentioned about manual code review, and it's kind of, you uh, know, uh, okay, but not not that good. But uh, any automated tools that can actually uh, scan this and give us some more detailed uh, um, uh, input on the on the code? Uh, yeah, you... um, there's a number of providers out there. Full disclosure, Git Guardian's one of them that looks for hard-coded secrets. Uh, Truffle Security is one, another one I would name off the top of my head. Uh, if you are all in on GitHub, GitHub Advanced Security is pretty darn good for what it is, um, but it only works on GitHub. Is like the the other thing on there. Thanks very much for coming. Um, uh, but yeah, there are other providers out there. And then there's the whole world of SA, uh, ST, um, Static Code Analysis, um, Static Application Code Testing, SACT, SAT. I'm getting my acronyms because I'm really at the end of a talk. Uh, but yeah, then there's the static code analysis tools out there and those range all over from sneak to, um, I just, there's a ton of them out there. Sneak comes to mind first when I, uh, the ones I always think of when I think automatic code review. Um, but yeah, if, if, it's a combination. If you use test, I believe if you use testing tools in conjunction with humans, that's the best outcome because manual code reviews, again, how do we improve the business logic? How do we teach, juniors not to code anti-patterns manual code review is best for that but it's like uh, back in my uh, website building days uh regression testing like pixel to pixel my eyes ain't that good i can't tell you the difference between two shades of purple i just can't uh backstop js could tell me every time and it was automatic and it took seconds and i would use it for that but for copyright yeah um or for actual copy i would want the person that has an English degree on the team to actually read over what I wrote, not not just trust a machine. Okay. Um, so an instant I've actually had a, at my place of work at one point was... I, I'm sorry, can you strike up? An instant I had at my work at one point um, a while back was we had a, a contractor come in from a you know consulting company uh, to help us build up um, and install a product. And a few years later, one of our guys actually went, hey, do we know about this Git repository? And found that on public GitHub, mm -hmm. the guy had uploaded, um, you know, a bunch of like infrastructure as code type stuff, uh, including secrets um, in that. Thankfully, by the time we discovered it, that test environment was gone. Now the passwords were active. Good. But theoretically, you know, at a point in time when that was uploaded, you know, there was potentially a test system where there were these passwords there. And like, mm -hmm. you know, you can have all your, uh, you know, we, we actually use Vault um, and, you know, we've got, you know, our own Git server and, you know, even if we had scanning on that, what's the sort of approach when you do have, you know, like what's stopping a, you know, a junior dev or some external person or whatever, just Git push 
to you know a public repository like how, how do you find that you know when it's not really in your it's not your repository it's who knows right like it, it can it, be anywhere if it's pushed privately you're right that the, the the greatest thing that get gives us is the ability that everybody that touches the code has the entire repository the most terrifying part of git is that everyone that touches the code has the entire repository this is the the double-edged sword uh if you actually type man git into a terminal it says git the stupid content tracker it's dumb it has no idea what it's doing um if they do it publicly there are tools that will look publicly. Again, that's where we started from. That was the first thing that our founders built was, let's look at every commit on GitHub and find out what strings there are. So that's our public monitoring product is literally look for your strings, uh, look for your vars, look for your um, secrets and let you know when they pop up out on GitHub public. Uh, we're not the only people that do that. and. Other solutions that pop to mind. I don't have. I don't have another solution that pops to mind immediately. But I do. There are other systems. I believe CrowdStrike. But if there's anybody from CrowdStrike in here, let me know if I'm right about that. But there are other tools that also can help you monitor public places. But it's it, that's the Toyota problem. Is <laughs> that their subcontractor pushed a repo publicly and didn't tell anybody, and it took a security researcher five years to figure it out. Um, there are other systems that are constantly scanning and monitoring, and that's only gotten better. GitHub itself will probably tell you at this point, depending on what secret it is. Their secret detectors are, again, pretty good. Uh, and if it's an AWS key, AWS is going to find it immediately. AWS is constantly scanning the entire Internet, constantly, because they have to. Any other questions? Because we're right at time. But there's nothing else after this, so I got a couple more minutes. Oh, yeah, a uh, question. Uh, let me get the mic up here. Are you trying to be loud? Is that better? It's for the internet. Oh, okay. internet. You can be loud in the room, but <laughs> the internet can only hear so much. So usually when we're talking about like credentials, we talk about like MFA or uh, two-factor authentication. Yeah. What level do you think that would come come to if we were say um, you know you're adding a passphrase to your SSH private keys, or um, maybe there's other uh, protections in place? So even if in the code a uh, you know it is leaked, maybe there's like network controls so that the server can't be reached from a external source. Hundred percent, hundred. That's a great point, point. Um, and that's something I guess I don't really, I don't talk about enough in any of this stuff because I'm so focused on the credential end of it. But this is one piece in the larger equation. Um, if you talk to us at the booth, the first thing I say is we are a code security platform because that's what we're focused on, network security. Um, the biggest thing I think people should work on is egress. Like know exactly where that traffic should be going. And if you don't know where that traffic is going, go fix that right now. Fix that before you fix this. Don't tell my boss I said that. Um, <laughs> I was on the internet, damn. Uh, but go 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 fix things like that. Um, because yeah, if the call shouldn't, that's the, the talk I saw earlier on um, MFA, issues with MFA. If the call is coming from somewhere weird, don't accept the call. Um, mm -hmm. But this is all part of it. So, yeah, uh, overall comprehensive security strategy, yes, you should have your network so locked down that if someone does get it, it doesn't work. But part of that strategy should also be we rotate so fast that they get the code from yesterday, it doesn't matter. That um, that line in Return of the Jedi, uh, their code checked out. It's a little old, but we're about to let them through. Like, that wouldn't even work in ancient Rome. Like, that's a dumb idea. Like, a password should be immediately invalid as soon as it's used. Or it just shouldn't exist. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, the more secure your network is, the better security. Yeah. Or like adding passphrases to SSH keys yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Password yeah. SSH keys should be a mandatory yeah. practice. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. Is that like level two, level three? Like, um, I don't know. Oh, if I was gonna, if I was gonna, gonna map it, it. I don't know. Trying to go back to the talk and stuff. Oh, like. if I was gonna map it, um, I would say it's somewhere between one and two. Yeah. But definitely three, you're gonna be using it consistently. <laughs> Because three is where you go, you start, the developers are starting to do things consistently. Level four is where it's mandatory across the board. Everybody does it and it's mm -hmm. building the process. But I think, I think level one is where you should start having that conversation of, hey, do we, do we do that? Oh, we do now? Okay, that, that's, yeah, let's we'll go along that path. Because there's no real hard boundaries here. It's like overlapping. And I, then, I like that. If I have time to, uh, one further question is, if you're doing all this scanning, um, how does disclosure work for you? when you find like hundreds of repos and hundreds of companies that are 
leaking these secrets. If it's public, yeah, we email the committer. Oh, okay. And say, hey, do you know this is here? Um, if, if whoever signed it. So if you're signing it with some email that doesn't work, mm -hmm. know that we can't reach you and we can't tell you about it. Makes sense. Um, so if you're, some people really think that's a security thing. Like I, I want, I don't want to use a real email, and there's no Git has no way to check. But that's the disservice you're doing. Like you as a committer can't be reached now. So who could tell you about any issues they find? So always sign. It doesn't have to be a good email. It could be like a Proton mail, but just make sure you're signing with something where we can actually reach you. Cool. All right. Thank you. Great talk. Oh, thank you. Any other questions other than that? Oh, one more. One more. And then we'll call you the last question. And then we'll all go get some coffee. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out with the uh, SSH thing, like if you yeah. use a uh, Volt or any other SSH CA, like you don't really have to encrypt your SSH thing. Like you can use OIDC or whatever to grab yourself an SSH key and then it rotates or whatever. Unsigning an SSH key. So if, if, if you use a SSH CA, like so Volt can act as an uh -huh. SSH CA. Okay. Or, or you can use SSH's own CA. Um, but if, if you use Volt as the CA, then you can use like uh, AD or any other authentication method to grab your grab the key from Volt that yeah. it will then use to log you into the server. So then you don't really have to worry about password encrypting it. Your, I mean, at that point, you're signing it with the certificate authority. Or that, that's at, taking at, care at, of this. at that point, you're using some other mechanism to give yourself the key, and then it's signing I, it for you. I think we're all on the same page. The more security you throw at it, the better. <laughs> it's a matter of technical implementation at that point. That no, you're, you're right. If um, if it's if you're that advanced on it that you're using it to sign, then yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps some people at home. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Give it up for Dwayne, Dwayne McDaniel.